Uh, we can start. Yes, sir. In a minute. Only full marks. Shall I start? Yes. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the monthly symposium organized by the Hyderabad Intensive Care Society. Today, we are going to discuss an important but a controversial topic that is steroid use in the ICU. Steroids are used for various conditions, somewhere it is indicated and others used without indication. The enthusiasm of using steroids in ICU has been waxing and waning since past several decades because conclusive evidence of their use is frequently lacking. So today we will be discussing their use in various clinical situations in relevance to the available literature that favors or discourages their use in various conditions. Can you the please share therapy? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry. Please, please, please. The first therapeutic use of steroids uh, dates back to more than three quarters of a century ago, where it was first used for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, and that um, uh, raised the interest in its profound anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressant effects. Since then, it has been its use has been explored across spectrum of clinical scenarios like sepsis, ARDS, trauma, in, immunological diseases. But we should remember that steroids are potent hormones with diverse physiological effects which can significantly impact the critically ill patient both in positive and negative ways. So we must be very judicious in our use. And so we are here today to discuss. Just a review of the normal physiology, that in health, it is the corticotropin releasing hormone from the paraventricular, uh, paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus that stimulates the release of ACTH from the anterior pituitary, that stimulates the adrenal cortex, uh, to stimulate the um, hormones. The adrenal cortex, which includes the zona glomeruliza, which is responsible for sec uh, secretion of aldosterone, which is a part of the RAS system, and the zo zona fasciculata and reticularis, which secrete the androgens and the cortisol. And this cortisol has a negative feedback both on the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. Stress, is, uh, as we know, is the most important stimulus of this uh, 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 hypothalamic pituitary axis and so steroid hormones are sometimes called as the uh, stress hormones. This uh, figure shows how one molecule of cholesterol is cleaved and uh, activated upon by various enzymes to produce the whole lot of uh, steroid hormones that includes the mineralocorticoids, the glucocorticoids and the sex hormones. The steroids exert their effect uh, both by genomic and non-genomic methods. The potent anti-inflammatory effect is by the inhibition of uh, the nuclear factor kappa, which is the major transcription protein responsible for down-regulation of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And this onset, which is genomic, is uh, slow to occur. The non-genomic action, which is more rapid in onset, is thought to occur by binding of the steroid hormones to membrane-bound and cytosolic receptors. It occurs at a higher dose due to increase in the secondary messenger activity. And the proposed non-genomic um, action is the effect on the cardiovascular tone, which includes the enhanced vasoconstrictor response to exogenous catecholamines, the modulation of skeletal and smooth muscle function and the inhibition of production of reactive oxygen species by inhibiting the enzyme cyclooxygenase and nitric oxide synthetase. So this table shows the list of exogenous steroids which we use in our clinical practice. Hydrocortisone, uh, we know, has e uh, uh, it shows the equivalent uh, glucocorticoid dosages. Hydrocortisone, we know, has equal uh, potency as a glucocorticoid as well as a mineralocorticoid. And it is preferred as a replacement therapy because of its short duration of action. It allows the hypothalamic pituitary axis to recover in between doses. But where we require more uh, anti-inflammatory uh, action, we prefer to use methylprednisolone or prednisolone, which have minimal mineralocorticoid activity. And dexamethasone has none uh, mineral aquatified activity. So while I was preparing for this talk, this uh, I came across this article, which is uh, uh, which is steroid use in critical care in uh, British Journal of Anesthesia, and it has very beautifully classified the indications of steroids in various according to various systems. Like in cardiovascular, it is used in septic shock, in perioperative replacement, in cardiac surgery, in anaphylaxis, in respiratory system, endocrine, neurological uh, emergencies. Uh, renal involvement in immunomodulation, organ donation, hematological emergencies, and we will be discussing the common and the controversial ones today. 
But before we proceed, I just again want to highlight that steroid use is a double-edged sword. Some clinicians use it as a last resort in the ICU. If nothing is working, let us give steroids, they might work. But their use is not benign. It is associated with some serious metabolic disturbances like hyperglycemia, hypernatremia, immunosuppression, which increases the risk of nosocomial infections and therefore mortality, ICU, um, uh, psychiatric side effects, ICU um, weakness, and upper GI bleed. And these serious uh, adverse events may be linked to the poor outcome of patients in the uh, critically ill patients in the IC. So <clears throat> knowing that increase in plasma cortisol uh, is a part of the adaptive response to an acute uh, stress condition. And if the patients who cannot produce this response inappropriately low response is associated with increased mortality, the term critical illness related cortis Costeroid insufficiency was coined in 2008 and the European Society uh, of Intensive Care Medicine in order to diagnose and manage this condition gave the guidelines in 2017. But they could not make a, any strong recommendations that whether we should use a random plasma cortisol level or a response to ACTH stimulation level to diagnose this condition or we should use free cortisol levels. What are the actual free cortisol levels that describe this condition were not established. So recently there has been newer insights into the pathophysiology of this condition and uh, by the use of tracer technology it has been seen that although cortisol levels are increased in stress they are much higher than what is the rate of increase of cortisol production. The rate of increase of cortisol production is less than double and that does not explain the high cortisol levels. And if cortisol levels are increased, the ACTH levels are not increased, they are rather decreased. So to understand this condition uh, better, we must know how the steroid regulation is disrupted in sepsis. Normally, uh, the it is the neural stimulation, but in stress or in sepsis, it is also the humoral activation by the inflammatory markers that are released by the neuroafferent nerve endings, cross the blood-brain barrier and stimulate the hypothalamus to increase the glucocorticoid secretion. Also, the damage-associated molecular proteins and the pathogen-associated molecular proteins also directly can stimulate the adrenal glands to increase the uh, secretion of glucocorticoids. This glucocorticoid, which is... Uh, mostly in the bound state, about 70 to 90 percent by the cortisol binding globulin is then metabolized by A-ring reductase in the liver and 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase in the kidney. But in sepsis, the, activation, the activity of these enzymes is decreased. Also, we know the synthetic function of liver is decreased, the production of um, proteins is decreased, the cortisol binding globulin is also decreased. Together, this peripheral metabolism alteration results in increase in the free cortisol levels. And this cortisol has a negative inhibition on the hypothalamic pituitary axis, the increased levels. The glucocorticoid hormone uh, is li uh, lipid soluble, crosses the cell membrane, binds to glucocorticoid receptors in the uh, uh, in the cell, and then that this complex, the hormone and the receptor enters into the nucleus to alter the rate of transcription. It increases the rate of anti-inflammatory genes while the decrease in the transcription of the pro-inflammatory. And this is its a genomic anti-inflammatory action. But there is some degree of decrease in the um, aff uh, affinity to the receptor and decrease in the amount of the receptor available. So some degree of corticoid resistance is also has been proposed in sepsis. So these are the three alterations uh, proposed post theories, pathophysiological theories for alteration of uh, the regulation in sepsis. The increase in the glucocorticoid hormone is not because of the failure of the central mechanism, but it is due to the alteration in the peripheral metabolism and with some degree of glucocorticoid resistance. So now we understand that what is critical illness related cortis uh, cortisol insufficiency. So for this, we can categorize our ICU patients into three uh, categories, either the ones who have pre-existing intrinsic hypothalamic pituitary axis disease. There might be a history of the patient being unwell, like lethargy, malaise, electrolyte disturbances, signs of adrenal crisis may present when the, triggered by an acute stress event like trauma, burns, or post-surgery. And they can be recognized by decreased cortisol level and increased or decreased ACTH into primary or secondary and might require cortisol supplementation. The second category of patients see which are acutely ill, which we see in the ICU commonly, sepsis with septic shock, who are not responding to fluids and vasopressors. 
here we know that the ACTH, now we understand because of the disc regulation, the ACTH test is not, it is flawed and it is not useful to perform clinically because most patients will have normal to low ACTH response because it is not the failure of the central mechanism. It is due to the result of the peripheral mechanisms and substantial increase in the cortisol distribution volume. The uh, low response is merely an indication of the severe disease. And the hemodynamic response which occurs when we give steroids, that is vasoconstriction and decrease in the inotropic use is a pharmacological response. And that does not indicate that the endogenous steroids were insufficient. So not the patients who are with pre-existing disease, not those who are acutely ill. The definition of critical illness related corticosteroid insufficiency better suits to patients who have prolonged illness. They are in the ICU with mechanical and pharmacological vital organ support for several weeks. So let us consider a patient who is with abdominal sepsis, he's undergone a laparotomy, he's in ICU for one month, undergone redo up laparotomies, still on the ventilator, still not very awake, requiring renal replacement therapy, even some degree of opioids. So the persistent hypercholesteremia, uh, which was uh, uh, cortisolemia, which was there because of the acute illness, increased circulating bile and acids, other um, agents uh, like opioids, all these are glucocorticoid receptant ligands, they stimulate, uh, the, sustain the negative feedback inhibition and therefore decrease the ACTH mediated cortisol release from the adrenal cortis so, and cause a uh, condition cause critical illness related corticoid insufficiency. And this phenotype can be uh, aggravated by use of opioids, etomidate, azoles in the ICU. It is challenging to diagnose this condition because the signs and symptoms do, uh, are difficult to differentiate from the critical illness itself, they are vague. Encephalopathy, delirium, patient not awaking even after uh, stopping the sedation, continued and unexplained need of vasopressors, electrolyte disturbances, but decrease in the cortisol levels along with normal to low ACTH may help on making the diagnosis. Considering that uh, supplementation is required, the uh, dose that is proposed is substitution dose 40 milligrams in the morning, 20 in the evening to resume uh, match the diurnal variation. And as this condition is uh, thought to be reversible, it should the uh, steroids should be tapered as soon as possible. However, tapering schemes are not clearly known yet. And discharge must be followed up with an endocrinologist. So regarding critical illness corticosteroid insufficiency, we know that the inability to maintain the high levels are associated with increased mortality. But what are the risk factors? Which patients will show an adequate response to stress and which not, we still do not know. The total cortisol levels, uh, while measuring the total cortisol levels, albumin should be taken into, into consideration and increment in uh, to the ACTH response is not the actual uh, method to diagnose uh, this condition. But then what are the clear diagnostic criteria or what is the specific threshold for plasma-free cortisol to be established are questions which are still un unanswered and for future research. Coming to the second, which is the uh, in the cardiovascular system, the most common indication for which steroids are used in the ICU is septic shock. The journey of steroids in septic shock has been long. Uh, I'll be highlighting few of the important trials. Anane in 2002 used both hydrocortisone and fluidocortisone to patients who did not respond to the ACTH stimulation test, thinking that there is relative deficiency. And uh, in their study, they showed that there is decreased mortality in which steroids were supplemented. So this test, ACTH stimulation came became an important test at that time and people started using this test. But this study was criticized because they had used etomidate in their study, which is a, and we know it is a suppressor of the adrenal response to um, the release of uh, steroids. So a larger study, that is the Corticus study, came in 2008, 500 patients, irrespective of their response, whether they were responders or non-responders, received hydrocortisone, and it showed no difference in mortality. So the uh, the test became uh, was thought to not to be um, effective in clinical research, and people started thinking that the occurrence of refractory shock itself is an indication, so they started using steroids. But then this study was also criticized for recruiting less number of patients. Other studies have been um, tried like high press studies in which steroids were given to prevent the occurrence of septic shock in patients of sepsis. But all these trials, they have shown that there is faster resolution of shock, but without any mortality benefit. 
The adrenal trial, which was published in NEGM in 2018, is the largest randomized control trial till date of use of steroids in septic shock. It was a double-blind parallel group randomized control trial in which 3,600 uh, patients, both medical and surgical ICU, were randomized to receive either steroids and placebo. Continuous intravenous infusion of hydrocortisone, 200 milligrams were given. But it did not show any improvement in mortality, 90-day mortality. However, there were significant secondary outcomes, faster resolution of shock, discharge from ICU, and mechanical ventilation. Large uh, meta-analysis have been con uh, con conducted in uh, the recent years, in 1918-1921, including large number of randomized control trials and large number of patients. But all of them echo the same result. There is higher rate of shock reversal, no reduction in the risk of death, possible reduction in the length of stay in the ICU, and slight increase in hyperglycemia, hypernatremia, and neuromuscular weakness. So why is it that trials and meta-analysis are not able to deliver what we see? It is because heterogeneity of the sepsis syndrome itself is the core of the problem. The 36 out of the 50 trials which have been included the control group itself has a varying mortality of 6% to 90%. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in the, uh, the patient group itself. Some patients respond and others do not respond. So heterogeneity lies at the individual level. And when we club all these patients together in randomized control trials, we do not probably get closer to what we are finding. So are these trials different? When we compare the Anane trial and the Corticus trial, the raw data from both these studies are the same. So several studies which have examined sepsis treatment, they have shown inconsistent data on mortality. But one thing is to be noted that they are consistent among their secondary outcomes. There is uh, definitely decreased vasopressor need, increase in the ventilatory free days, less time spent in the ICU, and the undesirable effects seem to be small. So seeing the safety profile of steroids and uh, their potential benefits in hastening the uh, reversal of shock, they have perhaps reasonable to consider these um, um, steroids in the management of septic shock. So considering and acknowledging these controversies, the surviving sepsis guidelines have recommended, uh, they are recommended against the use of ACTH stimulation test, against the use of steroids in patients who respond to fluids and vasopressors, but they recommend the uh, steroid use in patients who are not responding to uh, fluids or vasopressors to restore their hemodynamic stability. Hydrocortisone doses, 200 milligrams in divided doses. And this has been reinforced by the recent update of the 2017 guidelines, which had recently shown the that is, these guidelines were, this is the focused update of these guidelines published just last week. This again suggests the use of corticosteroids in patients with septic shock. Although they recommend against using a high dose for short duration in the patients. And the dose recommended again is hydrocortisone 200 milligrams IV continuous or divided doses with or without fluidocortisone. Because uh, wherever hydrocortisone and fluidocortisone have been used together in whichever trials have shown mortality benefit. But the credibility of this subgroup is still unclear. So there is a a conditional recommendation to use these steroids. We should not wait for the last moment that when uh, anotrope dose has been escalated to very high dose. It recommended dose according to the surviving sepsis guideline is norepi dose increasing above 0.25 or 0.4 microgram per kg per minute. Steroids should be added up in patients with septic shock to restore their hemodynamics. Other card cardiovascular indications include perioperative replacement. Patients who have chronic uh, be on chronically on steroids like prednisolone for more than three months might require a uh, bolus uh, dose of hydrocortisone when they are undergoing a minor procedure or this may be continued for next 48 to 72 uh, hours when they are undergoing a major surgery. A perioperative uh, plan should be made for each patient by the uh, perioperative team and unexplained perioperative hypertension should prompt a uh, steroid replacement if not occurred earlier. Anaphylaxis, we know steroids are the cornerstone of treatment. Uh, following adrenaline and IV fluid, hydrocortisone should be administered and it has been recommended and uh, is, uh, I think, practiced all over. Uh, other indications include after cardiopulmonary bypass. The 2017 guidelines did recommend the use of steroids in patients undergoing cardiopulmonary bypass 
help us, thinking that an intense inflammatory response occurs due to the contact of blood with the extracorporeal surfaces, which leads to vasoplegic shock, ALI, and multi-organ dysfunction. But two large trials, that is the DEX trial, dexamethasone for cardiac surgery and steroid use in cardiac surgery, have shown neither have found an improvement in mortality nor an improvement in AF as it was suggested with the previous trials, but rather an increase in myocardial injury. Like sepsis, we come on to the second system, that is the respiratory system. Like sepsis, the role of steroids in inhibiting the progress of ARDS via anti-inflammatory response has been long debatable in ARDS as well. The ARDS network study showed that it should not be used after two weeks because it is associated with late mortality, but guidelines are not still clear about what is their role in early ARDS. So again, coming to these 2017 guidelines for critical illness related cortisol insufficiency, they proposed that in early ARDS, that is moderate to severe with a PF ratio less than 200, methyl prednisolone should be used in the dose of one milligram per kg if it is up to seven days and later six to 14 days, two milligram per kg. And why methyl prednisolone? Because it has greater penetration into the lung tissue. But it is our duty, our responsibility when we are using such high doses of corticosteroid to uh, check for infections that um, we should have prompt identification and treatment of the hospital acquired infections in case we are using such high dose of steroids. So these guidelines prompted larger trials and this was published in Lancet in 2020 by Villar. They used dexamethasone, 20 milligrams IV for five days. It was a large multicentric randomized control trial conducted over 17 ICUs in Spain. The primary outcome that was ventilatory free days at 28 days was significant, although all cause mortality and ICU mortality were also significant for use of dexamethasone in ARDS. Large meta-analysis have been conducted and um, in the recent years, 2021 and 2022, including large number of patients, both because in COVID and non-COVID patients, because um, COVID rekindled the flame of using steroids in uh, ARDS patients. The trials do vary in the time of initiation of steroids, the duration for their use, and have used all kinds of steroids, hydrocortisone, methylpedrisone, and dexamethasone. So we can see their results, that is, they favor the use of corticosteroids in the um, ARDS patients. If, uh, the subgroup analysis, both COVID and non-COVID, their use is favoring. And even if uh, we do a, uh, they have done a subgroup analysis, that is, three uh, trials have used sub, uh, dexamethasone. This is the Villar trial in 2020. The Methylprednisone has been used by six uh, tri trials and three four groups have used hydrocortisone. All favor the use of um, steroids in ICU. Just I want to uh, bring to your notice that they, sorry, like these three trials, we can see uh, the older trials, 2005 trial, 2015, 2013. These are the re some older trials and they might be outliers. They may be skewing the result of the meta-analysis. The later trials seen in uh, 2021, 20, 2016, because we have understood the pathophysiology of the disease ARDS better following lung protective ventilation, fluid um, balance, and uh, prone ventilation, these are more towards the neutral side. So these, this result might be skewed by the earlier trials. Uh, but because the guidelines continue to recommend, these are the again uh, ARDS clinical practice guidelines published in the Journal of Intensive Care in 2021. Based on their meta-analysis, they wanted to find out which is the steroid which is best for ARDS and compared the mortality benefit, infections and ventilator free days. And it is low, methyl uh, low dose of methylprednisolone that ranked one amongst all of them that it has maximum benefit of mortality, decreased uh, risk of infections and highest uh, ventilatory free days. So steroids probably are effective to reduce the risk of death in ARDS and the effects are consistent in all adult patients, COVID and non-COVID and with all steroid types. They reduce the length of stay in the ho uh, hospital and duration of mechanical ventilation. The effect on the adverse effects is unclear. So the balance of favorable and unfavorable uh, effects probably still favors the use of ARDS. Again, coming to the update which has been given last week on uh, the use of steroids in ARDS, it is suggested that administer administering corticosteroids to adult patients with ARDS syndrome, conditional recommendation with modern uh, 
moderate certainty in the earlier trials have given in earlier ARDS and they have classified it according to the PF ratio. But now they have removed both of these conditions, neither early nor this. But, and they have uh, given the dose of early within 24 hours dexamethasone should be used uh, as were used by the Villar trial. In early ARDS, within 72 hours, methylprednisolone, as per their earlier recommendation, and in unresolving ARDS from 7 to 21 days, methylprednisolone, 2 mg per kg, and then slowly tapered over the next three weeks. So coming to the uh, next, another controversial uh, topic, that is use of steroids in severe CAP. Uh, <clears throat> the use of steroids in CAP, uh, you know, that is severe CAP where the PF ratio is affected and inflammatory markers are very high. It accounts for high mortality and the use is contentious because different recommendations make uh, different, uh, different guidelines, societies make different recommendations. The American Thoracic Society, IDSA are strongly against the use of corticosteroids in both non-severe as well as severe CAP, while the earlier European guidelines suggested the use of corticosteroids and they echo the same thing in their update given last week, give a strong recommendation for the use of steroids in severe bacterial pneumonia, community acquired pneumonia. However, they do not make any recommendation for adult patients who are hospitalized with less severe pneumonia. So this, uh, I just want you to uh, go through this article which has beautifully uh, uh, um, um, uh, 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 evaluated all the randomized controlled trials which have been included in the meta-analysis because this is one topic that is steroid use in severe CAP that where we have more published meta-analysis than the primary studies. The subgroup analysis shows that if uh, RCTs are patients, all RCTs include patients less than 600. The largest and the most recent Cochrane um, review also recommends use of steroids in severe CAP which has a mortality benefit but not in severe CAP. The earlier study, um, but these meta-analysis reviews might have been um, skewed by the poor methodological um, uh, of the uh, randomized control trials. Like this trial, which was uh, published uh, in uh, 2013 by Nafe et al. Although see uh, what is uh, the number of the patients included in the trial is only 80. They can, uh, can claim that the patients were baseline characteristics were similar, but AKI was more in the control group. So obviously it would have more mortality. Similarly, the other trial, um, which um, has uh, concluded eight day mortality, uh, not 28 day, not 60, 90 day, but just eight day mortality. And the patients who were included, uh, who had mechanical ventilation in the control group at initiation were higher. And the total number of patients is only 40, it is single centimeter trials. So they have might skewed the result of meta-analysis favoring the use of steroids in community acquired pneumonia. So other trials like uh, published by Medurai in intensive care uh, uh, medicine in 2020 have favored the use of steroids, but they referred to the need of larger trials before making stronger recommendations. So this was a very large, largest trial till date published in NEGM in last year, 2023, the Cape Cod trial. It was a double blind placebo controlled multicentric trial conducted in 31 French ICUs and 1150 patients needed uh, were to be recruited to provide 80% power. But after the second uh, interim analysis, after recruiting eight, 800 uh, patients, they found significant difference in the use of uh, benefit. So they found it is unethical to recruit another 400. The trial had several strengths. It was a multicentric trial and it had early initiation of hydrocortisone and uh, minimum selection bias, but it excluded patients, also it excluded patients with septic shock where we know steroids might have benefit. But it is, was a single central trial. It recruited only 800 patients lower than what they were predicted. And there were only 72 deaths across both the arms. That means less sick patients were recruited. And the microbiological investigations were also not standardized. So Positive clinical results are associated with use of steroids in severe CAP. They reduce the duration of antibiotic therapy, the length of stay, and faster uh, clinical stability. Small subgroup of patients with severe CAP, which has been defined variably in uh, studies. All studies have di taken different classification to classify 
uh, cap, the disease might benefit, but the etiology of pneumonia being varied globally, it is uncertain that the disease may respond consistently uh, to a single drug, and therefore the use of steroids, it is difficult to elucidate. Coming to the second indication in respiratory disease, that is you, uh, their role in obstructive airway disease. Uh, you know, we know uh, steroid use in asthma, COPD, decreases airway inflammation and mucus plugging. And so they, were, so they are recommended early in the course of disease. Oral administration is equivalent to IV administration that speeds up not only helps in curing the acute disease, but also prevents late uh, phase response. So oral prednisone 40 to 50 milligrams per day or hydrocortisone 100 milligrams IV six hourly, five to seven days and sh short courses do not require tapering if given less than two weeks. Coming to the use of steroids in uh, uh, pneumocystis carna pneumonia, Cochrane review confirms and quantifies the benefit of steroids in HIV infected adults with moderately severe pneumocystic Joversai pneumonia. It reduces the overall mortality. They should be given early with, uh, within 72 hours after starting PCP therapy. Prednisolone uh, should be given and it should be slowly tapered over three weeks. Uh, all, all, also, methylprednisolone at 75% of the equivalent doses can also be used. But what about in patients, non-HIV uh, patients with PCP pneumonia? Overall, if you use it is associated with increased mortality in unselected group, so it should be withheld in patients without hypoxia. It is beneficial in patients, non-HIV patients with PCP pneumonia only with hypoxia. Uh, this uh, role is uh, of steroids in airway edema is quite proven. We know patients who have prolonged intubation and recurrent airway instrumentation. We are fear of, uh, we have the fear of st uh, strider and respiratory distress after extubation. So methylprednisone uh, 40 milligrams can be given to patients who have failed the cuff leak test, but an appropriate time before planned extubation must be considered. Shifting gears and coming to the next uh, system, that is the neurological system. We know uh, bacterial meningitis has high mortality both in children and in adults and it is the inflammation and the leakiness of the blood-brain barrier that is responsible for causing neurological damage like hearing loss and cognitive impairment. So this was uh, the placebo-controlled double-blind uh, multicentric trial, although very old, but this was a landmark trial, use of dexamethasone, published in NAJM in 2002, and they showed that there is steroids reduced mortality when it is caused, especially by streptococcus pneumonia. And also it decreases the hearing loss when it is associated with H. influenza meningitis. A very interesting finding that was concluded in the Cochrane review is, that these steroids, they decrease inflammation and the focal neurological deficit, especially when it comes to high-income countries and not in low-income countries. So it indicates where we have a gram stain available earlier. Where patients reach hospital earlier, steroids benef are beneficial. So it is their early use and not late, which benefits uh, in bacterial meningitis. So various societies uh, like the Royal College Physician, the UK Society continue to um, recommend steroids for adults and children with bacterial meningitis. The steroid of choice is dexamethasone, dose 0.6 milligram per kg, but it should be commenced shortly before or simultaneously with antibiotics because antibiotics once given cause bacterial lysis and that causes the inflammation which is responsible for the neurological deficits. So if you have identified it as streptococcus pneumonia, it should be given for uh, four days and otherwise if you have made an alternative diagnosis, it can be tapered earlier. But compliance with this recommendation has been shown to be very poor. Coming to the use of steroids in spinal cord injury, the large trials, that is the spinal cord injury, NASIS-2, NASIS-3, and the Cochrane Review have shown that it is the only pharmacological therapy to have efficacy in phase 3 randomized control trial. But in spite of recommendations, there was controversy and uh, their use was... Uh, some had recommended against them. So a large international body was formed in North America, the International Congress of Neurosurgeons and American Association of Neurological Surgeons to review and re-examine the existing evidence and clarify the controversy. So again, it is recommended not offering steroids as 24-hour infusion to patients who present after eight hours, but only at 20... Now, they suggest using a 24-hour infusion to patients who present within eight hours. The dose is 30 milligrams of... Uh, 
per kg of methylprednisolone over one hour and 5.4 milligrams per kg per hour for the next 24, uh, 23 hours. But despite these guidelines, the motor and the ASIA score improvement in both short-term and long-term follow-up is not much. The, there are concerns of the harmful effects, especially pneumonia, when using this high dose. And patients with spinal cord injury may have concurrent traumatic brain injury where steroids are contraindicated. So practically, there's a lot of controversy and still their use is not uh, confirmed. As far as is raised intracranial pressure is concerned, use of steroids is harmful where if uh, the raised ICP is because of trauma or spontaneous ICH. But due to the mass effect of vasogenic edema in intracerebral tumors and brain abscesses, steroids may be helpful. But we have to be cautious in brain abscess that it, they decrease the inflammation and they decrease the penetration of antibiotics into the abscess. Steroids should not be used in traumatic brain injury. They have been associated with increased mortality at two weeks and six months. Similarly, the they do not affect the recovery. So they are not recommended in treatment of guillain barre syndrome as well. Definitively, the exacerbation of many acute uh, autoimmune conditions and inflammatory diseases, suppression of the immune response with glucocorticoids is a vital part of the management. And uh, in recently diagnosed, acutely diagnosed immune thrombocytopenia patients, the American Society of Hematology uh, uh, recommends to give steroids if the patient has platelet count less than 30,000 who are asymptomatic, who have minor cutaneous bleeding, suggest corticosteroid, uh, corticosteroid use rather than observation. And this uh, we can give either prednisolone or dexamethasone and they recommend against the prolonged course, in, but in the favor of a short course. And last is the use in uh, hemophagocytic lymphocyte, lymphohistiocytosis, which uh, the intensivists may be the first to diagnose these conditions in patients who are in sepsis with fever, uh, um, uh, pancytopenia, and uh, splenomegaly. The um, criteria, two HLH 2005 criteria must be used to diagnose because uh, they can be triggered by infections, malignancies. They have different pathological routes, but common terminal pathway. Steroids are the first line of treatment. Methylprednisolone uh, pulse forms the initial approach. In organ donation, corticosteroids are an important part to optimize the bundle and to improve vital organs. Methylprednisolone in dose of 15 milligrams per kg. We know that in patients with the myxedema coma, we need to supplement steroids before giving uh, supplementation of thyroid hormones. So they have role in endocrine diseases as well. So to conclude, I will like to say that steroids, they are uh, widely used in various scenarios. They have proven role in airway edema, anaphylaxis, asthma, COPD exacerbation, severe PCP pneumonia, bacterial meningitis, tumors, uh, adrenal crisis. But they are contraindicated in some conditions like traumatic brain injury and late ARDS. Their role is accepted but controversial in the ICU in patients of septic shock, in early ARDS, in severe cap, and in spinal injury. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gunjan, for a very uh, illustrative, but at the same time, very crisp and to the point summary uh, of where we are with students. Gansham. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Kunchan. Uh, I think one area where there is still uh, some amount of uh, confusion or some amount of uh, you know debate in day-to-day -day practice is the interchangeability of the steroids. Uh, there is a common tendency for many of us to kind of uh, use different different steroids. Uh, I think there are some certain situations where we have evidence for interchangeability with different types of steroids, but there are certain situations where the evidence is not very strong. For example, in septic shock, uh, apart from hydrocortisone, no other steroid is recommended. Uh, similarly, free ARDS, uh, people have used methylprednisolone, dexamethasone, even hydrocortisone. So there is some interchangeability there. Uh, similarly, in post renal transplant, again, it's only methylprednisolone in one gram dose or a big dose that is being recommended. Uh, so we also need to know the areas where there is some interchangeability that is kind of, uh, you know, we, we have evidence for that and certain areas where probably whatever steroid has been extensively studied, that steroid has to be kind of uh, used. Like in the guidelines, the focused update they have given, they have given the variety of steroids, all steroids uh, in uh, severe cap. They have used um, different uh, dosing regimens. 
have been used all over. Yeah. Mm. And again, even in post exhibition, cider people have used uh, dexamethasone, methylprednisolone, and as well as hydrocortisone. In our institute, dexamethasone is the preferred in air edema. But so it is the practice is different, different. Yeah, I think the problem is, um, as Gansham said, the interchangeability of steroids is a big issue. So we should actually be looking at what is the main purpose for which the steroid is being used. Yes. Are we looking at are we looking at uh, optimizing the electrolytes or the uh, you know renin angiotensin disarrangement? Are we looking at optimizing the inflammatory status? What are we looking at is what should decide what steroids are used because each of the steroids have got a preferential action. Some of the steroids have got predominant mineralocorticoid action, which are more useful for hemodynamics, more useful for electrolytes. Whereas those uh, steroids which have more glucocorticoid action have got like a lot of anti-inflammatory action. So what is our primary aim and how fast we need the action to be? You can't give a steroid which starts action of 12 hours or 16 hours for a post-extubation strider. Uh, you can't give a steroid which starts after 24 hours for the inflammatory edema of the traumatic the spinal cord. So that is, I think, I think your talk uh, has actually clarified uh, this role and where we should be very uh, pragmatic and practical in choosing the steroid. And also remember that not all steroids are the same. I think yes. that's the story. But, um, in this but it's been an excellent review. I think we are fortunate to have you with us on this uh, program. We hope to have you again. Uh, as part of this uh, initiative every Tuesday morning, please do share our agenda with your students next week downwards also. Thank you. Sir. Um, next week, actually, we'll be looking at uh, sedation in the ICU, another area where a lot of uh, uh, confusion prevails and people use sedation and analgesia and neuromuscular blockade interchangeably. Um, and that I answer, and quite disappointingly, that the practice of paralyzing patients without giving appropriate sedation is increasing again. We don't know why it is happening. So when we say sedation is bad, people stop sedation but don't stop the paralysis. So let's look at that next week. Sham, you want to say something? Sir, I uh, want to ask you, uh, what is your practice of using uh, steroids in ARDS patients? I have read all the guidelines they recommend. We are not using. No, we... Uh, uh, so, I, I use it quite frequently. I use a low dose of methylprednisolone, 1 mg per kg body weight. Right? Uh, not Definitely not in... Uh, if, if I have a suspicion of a uh, H1N1 pneumonia, I wait for the first few days. I think that is pretty much applicable to any viral, uh, uh, you know, etiology. Even in COVID, if you see, yes. uh, whenever they use steroids early on in the first week, the mortality was much higher. It's, it's only in the later on stages where probably the viral replication has come down and it's more of a the, the inflammatory response which is leading to the acute lung injury or the ARDS where there is a definitive role of steroids. So I use it quite often uh, for, for patients with ARDS. Not what? big doses. Yeah. When I do use you it? See, uh, many other times, by the time the patient comes to us, it's already beyond the first five days, six days of uh, illness. Right? So that way it's been, you know, Pretty clear when the patient comes. If it's beyond the first four or five days, I use methylprednisolone. Yeah, so I think this paradigm has to be relooked at because now there is understanding about two distinct phenotypes of ARDS. You have the hyperinflammatory phenotype of ARDS and the hypoinflammatory phenotype of ARDS, especially related to viral pneumonia. And it is now proven that use of steroids in the hyperinflammatory uh, phenotype of ARDS, especially from viral origin, seems to be reducing the number of intubations, number of ventilator days, um, uh, maybe not very significant effect on mortality, but some trend towards mortality and the steroid. And the, and the parameter they have used to identify this hyperinflammatory phenotype is a very commonly used biomarker, yeah. that is CRP. The yeah. CRP of more than 150 has been used as a cutoff to, for most studies to decide on the role of steroids. Uh, and the steroid that has been used for such hyperinflammatory phenotype is dexamethasone. Mm -hmm. So, in a viral pneumonia with a hyperinflammatory phenotype with a high CRP in the first week, I think there is still some justification for using dexamethasone as the uh, steroid. But after the first one week, it is up for debate. 
whether you can use methylprednisone. One particular individual like Anan has used steroids in septic shock. Meduri has persistently yes. tried and tried and tried uh, steroids in uh, his patients who seem to do very well uh, <laughs> steroids. Uh, all other patients don't seem to be doing very well. I don't know where this uh, and disparity is coming, but definitely uh, we should look at it. Maybe in, as, you say, as we now have understood that critical care is now more and more personalized prescription. Yes. You have to, to pick and choose every patient. There will be responders. There will not be any responders. We have to be balanced so that we don't overdo the steroid at the same time, do not deny the patient a useful therapeutic option for a probably fatal disease. Okay. Thank you all. Um, next week, we will meet again by looking at another uh, nebulous area that is sedation in the ICU. Uh, thank you very much. Enjoy the Republic Day and we'll meet you again next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gunchan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.